Yeah. Do what? All right, I'm Jenny. I'm one of the second year residents, if I haven't met you before. Uh, this will be my pre research talk uh, for my research block, which starts in July, so very soon. Uh, I'll be working with Dr. Ricci and Dr. Blevins on developing and characterizing a novel method for atraumatic chemical co reactions. Um, because of certain patent reasons, I won't be telling you exactly what the agent did, except to say that. Why don't you put the lights down, Jenny? More lights Behind down. It's me, no. It's me, no. Not me, no. Okay. Uh, so why would we care about making complexity as a patient of it? Anyway, uh, so there are reasons for, for both a clinical and a basic science perspective. From a clinical perspective, cochleostomy is one of the critical steps in performing cochlear implantation. Uh, 220,000 of these are performed, uh, have been performed worldwide according to the FDA, um, and with each year the uh, number of these that are being performed is increasing. Uh, preserving residual hearing will become increasingly important, uh, especially with the advent of electric acoustic stimulation devices. So these are cochlear implants. Uh, which electrically stimulate high frequencies, uh, but rely on the patients having uh, relatively preserved low frequency hearing, which they uh, will use with the assistance of acoustic amplification or hearing aid. Um, thus, being able to open the cochlea and insert the electrode with, that, with minimizing damage um, should hopefully increase the success of these operations. Uh, preservation of inner ear function is also critical to stapes surgery. So even though this is a surgery focused on the middle ear, there is a 1% risk of sensory neural deafness in the operating ear. Uh, if our technique could, say, be applied towards mobilizing a fixed stapes foot plate, perhaps the surgery could be performed uh, with lower risk of deafness. Uh, atraumatic cochleostomy is also important from a basic science perspective. So you can imagine if you were trying to image or otherwise study the inner ear, you would want to be confident that whatever method you are using to access the inner ear wasn't going to perturb what you're studying or damage it in any way. Also from a more practical standpoint, uh, you can imagine it's easier to train somebody to perform cochleostomy by dropping a, a dollop of uh, fluid on a a spot of bone than it is to train someone to do microsurgery with drills or with cold instruments. Uh, prior studies have looked at a lot of different things to try to perform cochleostomies less dramatically. So different kinds of lasers, different drill bits, different drill speeds, piezoelectric drills, uh, different kinds of uh, materials to put on the bone or on uh, the cochleostomy helon. Oh, there, there's a ton of studies looking at different techniques to try to perform this as atraumatically as possible. Uh, so our goal will be to develop and characterize a new way of doing it, um, using a chemical to essentially dissolve the bony odic capsule and give us access uh, to the uh, inner ear. We'll characterize it from both a functional and a morphologic perspective. So functional meaning, meaning hearing, and morphologic is uh, we'll essentially be doing HMEC. Um, so, reiterating, so we basically hypothesize that our technique uh, will allow us direct access to the cochlear scala by resorbing the bony otic capsule uh, while causing minimal damage to the underlying membranous structures. So, possible advantages of our technique compared to others. Uh, in theory, we could avoid direct mechanical injury to the by avoiding injury from the drill bit, bony fragments, or cracking the cochlea. Uh, avoiding thermal injury by heat generated from a rotating drill bit or from a laser. Avoiding noise-induced injury, which we've all heard ourselves. Uh, avoiding photoacoustic injury secondary to pressure waves that are generated by uh, laser use. Avoiding injury to vulnerable structures, such as a dishiscent facial nerve by, say, a stray laser beam or a reflected laser. Um, and finally, uh, an advantage would be being able to access the cochlea positions uh, through angles that normally we couldn't reach using a drill. Uh, 
So this technique uh, relies on the fact that bone is a composite of living cells, organic matrix, uh, crystalline salts of mostly calcium and phosphate. Uh, the idea is that the chemical will mechanically soften and erode bone by increasing the solubility of these crystalline salts. Um, similar techniques are used to decalcify bone for histology, so we'll be taking uh, a similar approach. To characterize our method, we'll be doing kind of a two-pronged approach. Uh, first, we'll be looking at live guinea pigs, and then secondly, we'll be looking at human cadaver temporal, bone, temporal bones. So for the guinea pig study, uh, our goal will be initially to look at performing cupriostomy on five animals, uh, where one ear will serve as the experimental arm and the contralateral ear will serve as the control. Uh, we'll characterize it functionally, looking at ABRs and distortion products, uh, OAEs. We'll perform this before we do any cochleostomy. Uh, during the cochleostomy process, so 10 minutes and 20 minutes after we apply the chemical to the bone, uh, after we expose the endosteum, and then a week after surgery. While we're doing the surgeries, we'd also like to uh, look at the perfusion of the blood vessels uh, in the stria and in uh, the lateral cochlear wall. And we'll do this by doing intraoperative fluorescein angiography. Finally, one week after all of our hearing and functional studies are complete, we'll sacrifice the animals and perform h &E sectioning uh, of the cochlea. We'll pay particular attention to the stria, the organ of Cordy, the vasculature, and we'll be looking for morphologic features of cell death, so things like nuclear fragmentation, cell blebbing, cell swelling. Uh, if we see a, a significant difference between uh, our control arm and our experimental arm at one week, we could always go back and sacrifice at, at an earlier time point to see uh, you know, when in this, in this process are these changes happening. Uh, so this slide kind of outlines now, how we'll be performing the cochleostomy. So under general anesthesia, we'll be uh, taking the guinea pigs and putting them in a stereotactic head holder. Uh, after shaving, we'll, we'll perform a post-auricular incision uh, until we uh, reach the bulla. So the bulla is a, uh, I didn't know what a bulla was until recently, but <laughs> it's essentially a, a thin, um, hollow uh, piece of bone uh, that encases the uh, part of the middle and inner ear in, in many animals, including guinea pigs. Um, so we'll perform a one to two centimeter opening in the auditory bulla, uh, which will allow us to look directly at the cochlea. Uh, our goal will then uh, be to perform a one to two millimeter opening in the cochlea and expose but not penetrate through the endosteum. After this, uh, we'll close just the subcutaneous soft tissue and skin. Um, on the control ears, we'll do the incision, we'll do the bulla opening, we'll do the closure, but obviously we won't do the cochleostomy. Uh, so moving on to our second, uh, our, or our second prong of characterizing this, uh, this new method, um, we'll look at human cadaver temporal bones. So this will allow us to kind of characterize, you know, if we use uh, different concentrations of the chemical for different periods of time, um, applied in different ways, you know, how, how long does it take to get through co uh, cochlear bone? What's the depth of penetration? What's the width? How much does the chemical spread? Um, so the cartoon is essentially you know, what we imagine we would see if you had different uh, concentrations or you applied the uh, chemical for different amounts of time, you would see uh, different shapes of penetration into the bone. Uh, so this, these are pictures from preliminary studies that Eduardo has performed, uh, doing cochleostomy on the basal turn of a guinea pig cochlea. So first on the left, uh, so here is the bulla. We have a one to two centimeter opening in the bulla. We're looking at the cochlea. Here's the round window membrane that you can see. In the middle picture, same thing. So the bulla opening. We're looking at the cochlea. The cochlea is the what's kind of in in focus round window membrane, and here we have a, uh, a drop of the chemical. And then finally, the, the last picture on the right, you see again the bulla opening, the round window membrane on the cochlea, and a cochleostomy. 
Uh, so this is a rough timeline uh, of what I'll be trying to follow over the next uh, six months or so. So initially I'll start with learning <coughs> all of these techniques of performing the surgery, of doing the histology, of performing uh, the hearing testing. Uh, then we'll move on to actually performing the experiments. So we'll start with the actual surgeries, do the perfusion studies, sacrifice them a week later, concurrently uh, we'll start on the human temple bone studies. Uh, as I transition into my part-time research, I'll uh, do more data analysis and allow that time for any follow-up studies that need to be performed. And then finally towards the end I'll try to sum everything up uh, maybe into a, a paper. So of course with any project there's a lot of potential problems or hurdles. Uh, you know, we're thinking of sacrificing these animals a week after we perform the surgery, but it's possible they just won't survive a whole week. Uh, so of course you could just skirt around the problem by sacrificing the animals earlier, or we could try and figure out what some of the issues are, and we, we, we'll just have to see what those are. Uh, another potential issue would be that we get discordant results between our functional and our morphological studies. So this would probably manifest itself as a hearing threshold shift, but then when we do the morphology, we don't see any difference. We, don't, we can't explain why. Uh, so one reasonable explanation for this could be that uh, the stria vascularis, while it doesn't show any morphological change, as a functional change, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't create that ion gradient uh, between the endolymph and the perilymph anymore, and so you uh, have a threshold shift in the hearing. Um, so we could try to assess for this this, if that were the case, uh, by directly measuring the endocochlear potentials. A um, bunch of boring references for you. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd just like to thank Dr. Ricci and Dr. Blevins and Eduardo for all the help that they've given me up to now and for all the help they're giving me to the future. <laughs> <laughs> One, one suggestion you might want to consider, it's very easy to put an electrode on the round window of a, of a guinea pig. It's right there if you do go through the bullet. So you can monitor the cochlear microphonics while you're working on while you're doing it to, to show real time effects what you're doing. Thank you. I was concerned when I saw your slide when you were showing me the time that you were you said. The times you had on there were 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and one hour. Is that really how long it takes? Because normally it takes like 10 seconds to make a healthy But it takes an hour to do it. It may not be something that people want to use. Yeah, so uh, with the agents alone, it can take uh, 30 minutes, up to 30 minutes to go through the cochlea. However, when it's mixed with a second chemical, uh, it goes much faster. But with the second chemical, it's harder to control it because you just haven't characterized it yet. So. Any other suggestions? All right, so my name is Ash, as most of you guys know, and I will be presenting my survive project today regarding um, the use of hospitalizations after um, so, one of the things that I noticed when I was an intern um, uh, on plastic surgery and then on the neck was that the uh, plastic surgery patients, it was very common for them to go home with five or six strains. And then um, when I came on to our service, I realized that most of our patients actually stayed on, and one of the main reasons that they stayed in the hospital was for strain management. Um, so, I was always curious to see if we can reduce the number of post. Um, uh, surgery uh, hospitalization because of uh, drains alone. So I decided to undertake this um, mini study to uh, see what was the reason that our patients stayed in the hospital after surgery. So um, I looked at uh, the patients that underwent neck session at Stanford and tried to identify uh, some of the reasons why they were there and, and um, wanted to analyze uh, these factors that contributed to uh, the hospital stay, as well as the costs that are associated with the um, uh, hospital stay. And the plan
plan is to come up with um, a study or uh, some sort of a plan to kind of encourage our faculty and the residents to um, hopefully, in a safe manner, uh, let the patient go, uh, patients go um, uh, earlier. So the design of the study was uh, pretty simple. I looked at the neck dissections that were performed by our faculty between October and May of um, uh, October of 2012 and May of 2013. Uh, these could have been done alone or with other procedures combined, and there was really no exclusion criteria. Uh, using this method, I identified uh, 51 patients. Uh, all the charts were pulled from EPIC and reviewed. I excluded six patients because I actually know the next section that I performed, even though it was quoted for, um, uh, and usually it was because it was a neck mass excision or so on. Um, so I identified 45 patients remaining with 153 days of uh, post-operative stay. Um, the patient population uh, has an average age of 59. The uh, post-operative state is uh, 3.5 days on average, as you can see. And uh, there is a 2 to 1 male to female ratio. So some of the diagnoses that the patients were uh, getting surgery for um, uh, was uh, broken down by site, uh, oral cavity, oral pharynx, uh, uh, followed by um, other, which is a conglomerate of uh, different findings, and of course, our known primary and our known thyroid. Um, these patients underwent, uh, obviously, these uh, procedures. Uh, the neck dissection was obviously the most common procedure, followed by a dissection in the oral, oral cavity, <coughs> which included digital buccal sulcus, full of mouth, tongue, and so on, and uh, or pharyngeal suction, uh, I'm sorry, resection, uh, which was the next most common procedure. Um, and you guys can uh, appreciate the rest. Um, I combined the pan endoscopy and tonsillectomy, and, uh, which includes lingual tonsillectomy, and um, uh, uh, combined with regular tonsillectomy uh, into one, because usually these are performed as part of pan endoscopy. So um, I tried to find out, um, I basically went through and uh, uh, found out all the reasons that uh, the patient was in the hospital for us um, on a day to day basis. And uh, it turned out that drain wash was really the most common reason, although I would say these are not mutually exclusive. So it could be that the patient was there for drain and a diet. So it, that's why the numbers add up more than the total number of hospital days. So the drain wash is 143 days, diet 34, and other um, categories were a minor reason for this. As you can see, drain wash is really the majority of the reason. Why the patients were there. Uh, out of these uh, uh, patients, 13% uh, were actually discharged in drains. These occurred on post up day 2, 3, 4, 4, and 5. And um, the plan actually for these patients had not been for them to go home with drain. For most of them, they, they were actually discharged uh, because they had a fresh one to go or the drains were just pushing too much. Um, so I tried to figure out how to. Um, uh, identify the predictors. I mean, obviously, I'm very biased to figure out that this is all due to drain. So I looked at a few different variables. Um, age, um, it turned out age is not really correlated with um, the hot length, length of the hospital stay. Sex was interestingly correlated. It reaches um, significance just barely, and it's uh, uh, during when you're in one of these slightly earlier cohorts. The average stay for um, uh, men is 3.7 days, and for women is 3.6. 3.4. Oral cavity resection did not have any association with hospital stay. Oral pharyngeal resection was actually highly significantly correlated with the length of the hospital stay. Obviously, pan endoscopy and uh, tonsillectomy, lingual tonsillectomy were not. And, um, uh, however, the, um, if the uh, patient who went bilateral neck resection, it actually lengthened the uh, hospital stay, and JP number was also. Highly significant for uh, strong association with the length of the hospital stay. Uh, during the hospital stay, we didn't really identify any major complications, um, which is good. Um, and there were some minor complications to report. Um, uh, there was a fall on post op day zero, there was chest pain that patient had post op, um, and uh, the rest of them were pretty minor, with the exception of uh, C. diff uh, diarrhea, which was. Um, on post-up day three, 
Um, as you can see, um, appropriate action was taken for most of these, uh, and um, uh, they really uh, uh, not really significantly delay or change the outcome of the patient. So I decided to really focus on the patients that have undergone neck dissection. I identified the patients that um, uh, were there uh, longer, and, and there was a, obviously a subgroup that was uh, that had under, underwent oropharyngeal resection, and those patients ended up staying there a lot longer because of tooth pain um, and various factors. So I decided to just focus on the patients that had not <coughs> undergone those procedures. Uh, Twenty-eight patients remained. Not yet hospital days, and the average is 3.2. And out of those, there is 73 percent of the hospital days can be truly attributable to tooth pain. That means there was no other factor that was happening besides the JP. Before I had shown you that there were multiple reasons in one day, but here it's just purely JP. So, um, if you start with um, the plan to discharge the patients on post up day one, which is when after day. I get training for the JPs and so on, and subtract that from the uh, total, you get 43 hospital days that can actually be saved, and I have the 1.5 hospital days What does that mean in terms of cost? That is a kind of difficult topic to figure out. Uh, there's a, a, a paper that was published uh, in the Netherlands about it. They uh, studies uh, looking at length of stay after the training and so on. Uh, it's related to um, breast um, surgery. Uh, this one um, is a little outdated from 1998 and basically found that if you send the patients home early and give them a nurse to uh, visit on them and so on, uh, you would save about, um, it looks like about $1,300 per patient um, based on their lower costs of care. Um, I was trying to figure out exactly what the cost of hospital stay is at Stanford. Um, difficult to find. There's an interesting article in the LA Times that showed uh, Northern California hospitals, how they're so much more expensive than Southern California hospitals. Because if you don't have insurance in a, in, a, in a hospital, average for this area costs you know, 7300 uh, $7, And these are the rates that are paid by some of the insurers in this region. Um, so I wanted to see what was out there as far as patients going home early with trains. Is that something that is actually feasible or is that not? And so um, I tried to focus on a few different search terms, uh, looking at cervical lymphadenopathy, thyroid. Um, I really didn't find much. I was, uh, I'll show you one paper that I found out of UNC and Hopkins regarding cervical lymphadenectomy. Um, most of the papers are from axillary lymphadenectomy and they're related to um, breast cancer. So the paper that was done in UNC uh, they did a retrospective series looking at 260 patients. They identified uh, 23 patients that were discharged home early. Um, these were um, uh, basically patients that really had really good social support and so on, and they were kind of randomly decided to uh, go home early. Um, and they really found, they didn't really compare anything. Uh, they didn't really compare the uh, early with the late group, but they found two stromas that were really late. There were no major complications, so they were saying that uh, this is a safer approach and they're a correctly chosen patient. Um, most of the studies that began surfing, surfacing regarding axillary lymphadenectomy, those, those started in uh, the 1995 era, a lot of them came, came out of England. Um, basically, they looked at early discharge versus late discharge, and the gist of it is that there was really no difference between the groups when it came to seroma formation, wound infection, and so on. The only thing that they did found significant difference for the patients that went home earlier, <coughs> they had less restricted shoulder movement and less wound pain. Um, I'm not sure if they were as due to, but um, when you get up and move out earlier, I have, I have no idea. There was another study that looked at, uh, yeah, they subjected them to psychological testing. <coughs> patients that went home earlier ended up doing better. So, um, um, this is another study. Uh, this one uh, focused a little bit more on uh, whether this would uh, increase the chance of wound infection. Um, that didn't turn out to be the case, although they did have positive brain cultures uh, more often in the early discharge group, but there was no actual clinical infection. The stroma incidence as, uh, is a close to the So, in conclusion, um, uh, I find that I found that 
uh, after this uh, basic review that most of our patients that undergo neck dissection stay in the hospital just for treatment management. Um, and if you recall the, the slide I showed you, most of our um, complications are pretty minor. Uh, they didn't really affect the course of the patient and there are things like eventually even if they fail and have an outpatient basis. Uh, so I think it's uh, very feasible for us to consider a early discharge more often um, in the selected population, in a good selected population, meaning they have good prospects of holding on to the bar bed and they don't have too many medical comorbidities. And um, I would like to, um, and I want to pose this to the faculty and see if this is something that they think is useful. A randomized controlled trial looking at our patients uh, undergoing neck dissection uh, to see if we uh, do early versus late discharge that has any uh, effect on uh, the risk factors. So that's the latest. Um, I'd like to present a project that is just ramping up, uh, but in process and we'll be a little bit more no longitudinal. Um, I've been thinking a lot about a problem that I'm always been thinking a lot about, um, specific to how we uh, share or communicate the several types of visual-based data we collect on a daily basis, especially in our specialty, but as surgeons generally, um, especially in the context of what is becoming a major legal hurdle, already is a major so um, I started thinking about it. The problem is, you know, this, the scenario is very typical, and we do this almost every day, especially the junior resident. Maybe say the team is scrubbed on a big case, and there's a consult from the floor, from the ED, doesn't matter where, um, and it's going to require a flexible laryngoscopic exam at a bedside. And the junior resident, and this was very real to me when I started on day one as an orthopedics resident <laughs> at this program. Um, is sent to scope the patient and does that scope and attempts to relay that information back to the team, which is often stuck in the operating room uh, verbally. Um, when you're a junior resident, you don't really know what you're looking at. I don't care how many books you've written, and I still have trouble. Let me just continue. Um, but um, uh, if you have a way to communicate that data uh, efficiently, I think it would really increase a the services efficiency, but also a lot of sort of opportunities for us to learn um, from our mentors. So the problem is, in, broadly in healthcare, um, is that we're getting busier. Demand is increasing. Our patients are sicker. Um, turnover is becoming uh, an issue because we're being pushed to do it quickly for very good reason. There's just more patients showing up who need care. Of course, we're absolutely limited in our capacity to provide that care um, because the number of physicians and trained practitioners is relatively flat compared to that. Um, and obviously, the things that limit this are physical, or physical distance, time, and then, for instance, for residents, work hour restriction. Um, and our communication methods are very inefficient currently, and there's companies working on this right now. First of all, we're stuck in the operating room, or more importantly, our attendants in this setting are stuck in the operating room, often in our clinic, and you just at once. Uh, the pager system is really, really antiquated and inefficient. There are companies who are working on that problem. Um, and um, uh, they're making some progress. But um, okay, hold on for surgeons in particular, visual data is just very important to us. What we do with our eyes is an important type of data. Um, this is, like I mentioned, obviously everybody here knows this, is very true in ENT. A lot of our diagnosis is in person, uh, via scope exams, and uh, just like other surgeons, looking at wounds and incisions and flaps, et cetera. We have, all, we have several modalities where we use our eyes, obviously. Just looking at wounds, all the scope exams I just mentioned. It's fairly unique to our field, aside from perhaps if you're going to tell it. Treatment decisions are based on these findings often. So this is critical. Right. Um, we do a good job of that, but it's still just a little bit inefficient. But again, the problem here is that the folks with the expertise need to be in multiple places at once, and that's just not possible. Um, the existing solutions to this problem are basically, like I said, the old, good old-fashioned verbal communication and telephones and whatever. 
walking back to the operating room and telling them what you found. I agree that that's an important part of learning, learning how to uh, convey what you've seen, but sometimes you really don't know what you've seen or perhaps aren't aware that it might be quite good. Um, this kind of communication is really rapid, which is great, but it's very subjective and it's incredibly imprecise. I mean, we become eyewitnesses, and eyewitnesses are really um, not reliable. And then, of course, there's increasingly the use of new technologies like text and email. Um, these are really convenient and they're objective. Unfortunately, they're oftentimes illegal uh, the way we use them. Um, so the cost of this problem to us is really poor continuity of care from our patient's perspective. A lot of redundant exams. A lot of times when we do a laryngoscopic exam and there's questionable findings, we have to bring the attendant back, sometimes hours later, and repeat the examination. And that might not be a big deal to us, but for a pa patient, especially maybe a kid, um, that can be quite significant. Um, again, these are imprecise and subjective exams, and, and we lose a lot of teachable moments. Um, uh, in the sense that uh, sometimes we just pass along these, this, this data is just lost. We see it, it goes into our cortexes, and we describe like what we see, and that's more or less the end. And then, of course, HIPAA violations. And this is becoming a bigger and bigger deal. Um, this, when you Google this, this is the New York Times article that comes up. This was about Stanford. Um, there was a $20 million class action lawsuit a couple years ago. Stanford has now had, just this institution has had four very high profile HIPAA. Um, breaches. It's, it's important to mention that a lot of times these breaches um, are from not so much paper, but the majority of them are from stolen devices, from laptops, mobile phones, where people have stored protected uh, information. And obviously there's an initiative at Stanford here to guard against that, but it continues to be a problem. Uh, based on some several studies, about three quarters of physicians in the United States right now are texting PHI or uh, protected health information on a regular basis. Not that anybody here would ever do that. But by the number, 75% of us might consider it. Um, if you, based on some recent, uh, this is not my data, um, this is data that I found, but uh, there's been calculated that each occurrence of uh, texting any kind of PHI uh, exposes the institution and possibly the individual to about $40 worth of liability. And it's also important to mention that the rules have changed with the High Tech Act in 2009. So it's not just the HIPAA Act of 1996, it's High Tech. High Tech up the ante significantly. It used to be about $25,000 as a maximum fine. Now it's $2.5 million. Um, and there are cases going right now on that, on that scale. So this is obviously a big need area. The need, as I see it, is a way to capture and communicate image-based patient data securely so that we can improve our continuity of care, reduce the redundancy we spoke of, and then reduce exposure to HIPAA and migration. So to build this kind of a solution, I was thinking it needs to integrate with our workflow. It needs to be available to us at the point of care. It's integrated with the workflow in a matter that's not going to slow us down, but there's nothing more important to us than maintaining our workflows. It needs to really use the, the devices that we carry with us, because that is the preference that people are already expressing, and it's the most convenient. Uh, it has to be obviously a compliant, and um, for reasons I'll discuss later, it needs to be cloud-based. For one thing, cloud-based data is actually more secure. For the reasons we talked about before, um, cloud uh, data has been shown to be more secure than putting it on devices, even encrypted devices. So the solution I'm proposing, this is actually in uh, development currently, is basically a HIPAA-compliant um, later um, in a companion application um, that will allow us to snap photos of anything we want um, of our patients and make it automatically uploaded to the cloud and where it's secured. And then we're all able to share that from the cloud. Um, it's actually not a super complicated process anymore. There's several local companies who all they're doing is providing these layers for HIPAA compliance, and several of them have agreements with Stanford to make it okay for us to use it. So obviously, endoscopic exams that we could use it for, endoscopic exams, even otoscopic exams, preoperative lesion characterization, so we can share that kind of data, and importantly, uh, look at pre-op to post-op, or for instance, flat monitoring. There's a really interesting study that came out a couple years ago looking at uh, image-based uh, smartphone, smartphone use for post-op flat monitoring that showed a uh, high degree of sensitivity to flat failure. Um, 
And then, of course, you know, remote wound and laceration evaluation, uh, maybe downstream. So it's in development currently in phase one. Basically, we're actually prototyping the app right now. Um, the first things will be to just deploy it, like I said, in our department, um, just so we have point of care image capture. And it's much secure. Um, after that, we'd like to kind of just make sure the user experience is OK and that it's actually functioning. It's most likely that there will be a, a, a continued preference for just to open the phone, open your camera, and take a picture. But hopefully, uh, in the context of the legality we can everything else, we can, we can integrate this in, in such a way that it, it becomes uh, doable for us at the point of care. Ultimately, maybe something that we could use for other data types. Um, and I personally like to, if we can build it out, think of it almost like an Evernote type functionality. It's not really a communication device like a, like a texting device, because it doesn't have that functionality. What it does is it just puts everything up on the cloud, puts data up on the cloud where it's secured, and then allows you to share it. And you can share it, doesn't have you share with it. I mean, this has possible implications for helping us standardize our sign outs across our different facilities. Um, also, if we're rounding and we're adding you know, data to this uh, kind of a system, and our attendees will have that information instantaneously, um, wherever they are. And the only communication function right now that we can perceive is that we would maybe be able to generate an alert when new data is uploaded, but it will not be a, a two-way communication platform. And then, and then obviously, there's, al there's already talk of integrating this with like a more real-time telepresence uh, system. And everybody's heard of Google Glass. And the company I'm working with actually has um, an agreement with Google, possibly. Um, but either way, we're going to try to downstream make it so that possibly you know, we, we can run studies and see if our, our ability to bring data into the operating room, for instance, to our attendees' eyes is beneficial. So again, we're currently in the phase of designing. And actually, it's actually being prototyped currently. And then Stuart, Stuart, you keep saying we. Who's we? Uh, just uh, a, a basically a collaborator I've got who's a dermatology resident. apps around dermatology, image sharing, and things like that, and chronic wounds. And are they using one right now? No, it's not. None of this is commercialized. It's just experimental. So they've got apps built out that are functional, but it hasn't been deployed. It's not in the app store or anything. Yet. And are you working with Stanford IT to make this all part uh, of Stanford system? Yeah, so we're not going to integrate it directly into the Stanford system. What we need is what we have, and we need is just permission to use this. We have to, obviously, anytime you're using patient data, uh, Stanford has to approve you as a sort of a, not really a vendor, because it's, it's not a commercial entity. But even still, um, having the ability to take patient data and, quote, secure it, you, they've already gone through that process. They have to get the go ahead um, that uh, Stanford's going to allow us to use this on the tab, uh, on the patient's tab. Um, for instance, it can't be currently deployed at the VA, theoretically, until we can make sure that the VA IT people and security people you know, vets. Um, but that's probably a much longer process. Stanford's actually good. They've got agreements in place with several companies now. This is becoming very commonplace. I mean, it's a big problem, and Stanford knows it. They're very exposed, and they're very motivated to, you know, to make sure that, you know, the providers actually have this, this kind of tool available. <laughs> Eventually, I talk about this console data. This is just because of the, the user interface we're thinking of, or that I was thinking of, was sort of like a console core type thing. Again, it wouldn't really be a direct communication platform, but theoretically, we could have a system where you build a card with whatever data you've got from the point of care, and you can forward it to somebody else if you want to weigh in. That's a little bit more of a complicated problem. Um, and again, that would probably require much more involvement from Stanford in order to deploy it in the EV. But that's the downstream, that's the, that would be the goal. And then, uh, ideally, even further downstream, I, I like to call this service standardization. Something that I think is really interesting is if we can kind of have a layer where we're, you know, shipping a lot of our clinical data um, that's, that's you know, secure. We can use that, especially in the way we sort of standardize the way we think about rounds and think about sign out into one system. We'll probably save ourselves a lot of time and headaches. And then EHR integration—that's a complete pipe dream. There. One big barrier here is that Epic and the uh, large uh, EHR vendors are not at all friendly about this. And they're, even though patient data is not proprietary, they treat it as such and they kind of lock it down. But 
there are protocols that exist where we can get the data. It's probably even that area we don't even necessarily want to dab on. But we're gonna... um, so again, I talked about this. The downstream, maybe sort of a pilot study we need to use that we've thought about. Focusing on console heavy special uh, uh, and visual heavy um, surgical surgery services like us or the PAs and plastics, where oftentimes just the ability to see something um, can affect care in an efficient way. Uh, and definitely can streamline our ability to handle lacerations and um, infections and things like that with the emergency. And then, the and then I talked about service standards. So it's, it's in development right now. Um, we have the go ahead and, and stand for to use this service. Um, and again, it's important to say that this will not be, uh, you know, like a communication device. Really, the only communication is that it hopefully will be available to all of us. Um, and then we can designate who has access to that. Yeah. When you say that you're compliant, do you mean that you're going to store HIPAA? Photographs that then we can share that are better protected than yeah. our iPhones, right? No, you don't actually have to de identify it. Um, it's the HIPAA compliant standard you're expecting. I don't actually know, you know, I know what you, we all know, sort of know what the general rules are, but the folks that do the, that built the platform um, have built it such that you do not have to de identify the data. It just has to meet certain criteria for security, and that, that literally includes the physical location of the servers they're using. Like that. There's several requirements. A great idea. You know, I've been using Dropbox for a long time, so this is how different is it from using the Dropbox? The, only, the difference is it'd be a little bit, um, I, I hope to integrate it a little bit more seamlessly. It will happen automatically. If you open the application and take a picture with it, it's going to be done. That's it. It's just like taking a picture with it. You don't have to manage the data in any way. You're going to be at liberty to. You're going to be at liberty to. Um, just, it's very much like Evernote. You, you, you're going to be at liberty to organize the data however you want if you choose to. But bottom line is, uh, it's just a one click, well, you have to do a password and then you click. But at the um, moment, if you're I using Evernote and Dropbox with protected health information, you're on very thin ice. Well, yeah. just for personal yeah, it's stuff. Just not personal, but for personal stuff, stuff yeah. Anyway. Actually, uh, I would suggest that box.net actually now is HIPAA compliant. And if you are using Dropbox, and, and they have a not only the different compliant, they have a BA they have a business agreement with Stanford right now. Actually, you're not supposed. I mean, I just emailed Jason about this like a week and a half ago. Mm -hmm. Unless something's changed, we're not to use Box. Oh, really? Until it's approved officially, and we're told. Okay. So don't use Box. Don't use anything. Until okay. Yeah. Approved. So that's right. And they're very serious about this stuff. Box had entered into a BAA yeah, with us. It's close. It's close, but it's yeah. not okay to use Box. And the reason is, is Box is Box is rolling that out. And that's just supposed to be integrated into their platform for everybody in the country. It's just automatic. If you're a box customer, supposedly you have HIPAA compliance. I imagine probably some of the concerns stem from that, but it hasn't been specifically vetted for standard. Stuart, I thought HIPAA says doctor to doctor communications are HIPAA compliant, no matter what where you put it. No, not if there's electronic data involved. As soon as it, for instance, over the I mean, if it's, so if you were in the hospital and on the hospital's Wi Fi, Using, for instance, Facebook, I mean, uh, um, FaceTime, that's actually HIPAA compliant. Um, but the minute you have to go to a cellular network, the minute you try to s secure that data and store it. So, really, the, the point here is to push data into the cloud and secure it. Yeah. And that has all kinds of long range possibilities. I mean, we're just scratching the surface of what we can do with really sophisticated analytics platforms and Looking at that and having software actually look at you know clinical data, imaging data, not just radiologic but actual pictures, and gaining insight from that and measuring it and putting it back as a clinical decision. The point is to push everything up to the cloud and leave it there secure. Okay. We'll see how it turns out. I mean, that, what I'm kind of timeline? So what the timeline time? tentatively, um, I'm being told that the, that the developers are going to hopefully have a prototype in two months. That's a little bit long for my case, but they've got a thing going on too. I'm not, I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, this is low priority for me. Um, but hopefully, once that happens, I, I imagine, I'm hoping by three months we can have it in our hands. And I'm going to double, you know, the other thing we have to be careful of is really making sure we have specific uh, rights from Stanford. And then we've been told, you know, they've been told as an entity that they're covered and that we're okay to do it. But I, to my own 
this um, right now, it's pro bono from the developers. Well, it's not pro bono. Well, they're, they're playing for the servers. They're yeah. planning on doing something with it. And what, right. So, what well, is for the now, intellectual property of the stuff they develop? Well, the IP is really, I mean, when, so, when we're talking about software, there's not a whole lot of IP around it. It's risky in that, in that sense. And it, the trick will be, and storing data, especially um, image-rich data, is expensive. Uh, so then right. why, are, why are they doing it? Well, they're gonna. I mean, I'm saying for me, they're doing it. This is a this is a company that is out there developing other apps. They're just lending me their um, their developers for now. I suppose downstream, um, if it works, then we'll have to we would have to work out whether or not we get commercialized. But right now, it's almost just a research document. Essentially, they're funding. Does that seem problematic? Well, I'm just telling you. Yeah, no, I don't know what happens. I mean, I'd sell them that people do things pro bono. No, I mean, I, 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 no, no, no. This, this is a... Uh, no, I think it's entirely reasonable to assume that if this... So what happens to the IC so when it does... Right. Give me something you have a piece they of would cer it's certainly... Yeah. Piece yeah. Of it. yeah, yeah. Certainly they would, they, 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 as the developer, would get the majority of it. Sure. If it commercialized. But they're willing to take the risk right now and just do it. Cool. 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 Cool